Good times. It's going to be a great lesson. All right, somebody remind me. What did we talk about yesterday? Uh, the Ventura. Did we ever? We don't really go too much into details that, right? We're, we're bound to talk about that. Yeah, let's just re remind ourselves, though. Tell me some things about Torque that you all remember from yesterday. The further away from the end. Yeah, the further away that you are, the more easier torque. it is, uh, the more torque, you, and we can say the easier it is to push it, okay? What are some other things that we learned about torque? If you do your force with an angle, then it'll be less on the torque, like the push will be less. That's correct. If you, uh, well, and an angle, an angle other than... Perpendicular, 90 degrees. Yeah, other than 90 degrees, yeah. Okay, because you're always going to push it at an angle at some point, but yes. And that angle is the angle between what we call the radial line and... Uh, the line of action, which would be a line containing the force. We call that angle right there, phi, and the formula is uh, torque equals radius, radius times force times the sine of phi. And that works out perfectly if it's 90 degrees because sine of 90 is one. And if you're at 180 degrees, you're pushing right along the line of action, it's zero. If you're, point, if you're pushing, if you're applying the force right at the pivot point, the radius is zero. Torque is zero. Uh, we talked about all those different things. We talked about how uh, we can have the net torque as if there's multiple things that are trying to uh, rotate multiple forces acting at multiple points that correspond to multiple torques. You can add them all up. There's a positive torque and there's a negative torque and um, maybe they're all positive, maybe they're all negative, whatever. Maybe it's a mixed mash. The net torque uh, can be calculated and then what you can do is you can act, the object will rotate as if there was just that net torque acting on it. Okay, so you, uh, they, they may cancel each other out or they may work together. Okay, and then we started talking very briefly about gravitational torque because every single thing has, every single object is made up of particles uh, and all of those particles are being pulled down by gravity. So you say, well, how are we supposed to figure out with this particular, uh, with this object, maybe the meter stick, how are we supposed to figure out what's going on? Because let's say I've got, um, its pivot point is over here at the end. Well, there's all those particles all the way along the meter stick are all being pulled down. And so all of those particles are exerting a torque. How am I gonna figure out what, what is the total torque? Do I find uh, this force times this distance, this force, the force here times that distance, this force right here. You see what I'm saying? You see the dilemma? And so what we can do is uh, we say, all right, we're going to consider this whole entire meter stick as if all of its weight is located, in this case, at a plate, at the center of gravity, okay? And in this particular item, it's at right here in the middle. And what we'll do is we'll say that the torque that this uh, that gravity exerts on the hinge point over here is this uh, we, we can consider it being located right here at the 50 okay so it's whatever the the weight is of the meter stick that's the force the weight force at this distance right here okay and so the center of gravity is the location on which we can consider all of the gravitational torque to be acting on all right, and uh, depending on the the shape of the solid, depending on uh, the distribution, like and the, the density, like maybe if this was a little bit heavier down here, then that center of gravity would be shifted a little bit closer to that end. If for whatever reason there's maybe some objects that are hanging on here, or the wood was maybe a little bit more dense over here, then that would shift the center of gravity a little bit over there. Now as it is right now, the center of gravity is pretty much right there at 50 centimeters. Okay, if I can get get this right. Um, did y'all read anything about balance? There's something interesting about balance and center of gravity. Go ahead and look at your notes. See if anybody. Yeah, if the center of gravity is directly above the pivot point. So right now, center of gravity is right here. The pivot point is where I have my finger. Okay, so if it's directly above, then the object will be balanced. And the reason is, is because all of the gravitational torque by the material over here, which is pulling down, is causing a torque to send it going this way. 
but over on this side, all of these ob all of these particles are also being pulled down, but they're exerting a torque this way. So I have a torque that is count uh, clockwise and a torque which is counterclockwise. And since this is the center of gravity, then it's uh, completely the same amount of particles at the same distance as we have over here. And you end up with something that's balanced, okay? Uh, you can try to find the center of gravity while I take attendance with a pen or a pencil that you have at the table. See if you can find the center of gravity. See if it's right in the middle or see if it's a little bit off to the side. Oh, here you go. This is a little more fun. You can, you can find the center of gravity with that. Emily, you can find the center of gravity with this. Uh, can you find the center of gravity of your MacBook? Y'all can use this for your center of gravity. Here y'all go, see if we can find the center of gravity of that. Don't let it fall on your MacBook. Doing. Is it right in the middle there, Miranda? Mm -hmm. Almost. Is it a, a cheating? It's closer to the left. Why do you think it's, it's kind of a little bit heavier on that side? Because of the eraser. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. What about you, Emily? This is about the middle, so I'm going to say yes. So we're probably going to assume that that board is uniform density mm -hmm. throughout. It's not too dense on one side or the other. How are we doing over there, Benjay? Hey, I think she has her pivot point <laughs> directly beneath the center of gravity. What do y'all think? Knowledge. Whoa, Kevin, you got something weird going on there. It doesn't look at all. Hey, you're not in the middle. Kevin, stand up here. Is that in the middle, Kevin? Why is that not in the middle for Kevin? Oh, oh. Why not? Because that's heavy. That side's heavy. Okay. So there's more mass, maybe you could say, on one side, right? I'll take the pencil. Brooke, what do you have? Pencil. Center. Is it is it right there in the middle? Oh, that's struggling. Oh, uh, so close. Hey, uh, Gracie, you know me. I can give you a tip on this, okay? Uh huh. Put the pivot point directly beneath the center of gravity. I just follow those instructions. If you're not, if it's Thank not you. working, uh -huh. then you're not following my instructions completely. I just know this one day this is gonna fall down. Got it. I guess it won't be the end of the world, but you got that. Okay. Oh yeah. All right, there we go. Is the center of gravity fun? Boom. Got so. Oh, oh, I had it. So, the gravitational torque can be calculated by assuming that the net force of gravity, the object's weight, the object's weight acts at a single point, and that's called the center of gravity. Uh, let's go ahead and utilize that fact in this next problem here. Uh, I don't think we did this problem yesterday, did we? Nope. No. Nope. All right. Let's, okay. Let's go ahead and do this one then. So, um, the symbol for center of gravity, y'all may have seen this. Have you ever seen this little sort of like circle with the squares, the yeah. quadrants? Um, you may have seen this on like crash dummies, maybe. Yeah. It's kind of they've got that kind of all over, you know, because they're they have identified the center of gravity um, on those crash dummies. 
So uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. We want to hang something up. We want to figure out, uh, we've got a 3.2 kilogram flagpole setting from the wall at an angle 25 degrees from the horizontal. That's normally what we would want to measure. Or it's something easy that we could measure. Uh, and somehow we determined that its center of gravity is right here, 1.6 meters from the point where the pole is attached. What is the gravitational torque on the flagpole at the point of attachment? Because we want to make sure that whatever you know fasteners or whatever we get can, can handle this particular flagpole. 3.2 kilograms isn't too crazy, but you know uh, we can extend this to other ones that are. So here we go. Uh, we've got our known information, our given mass, radius, and uh, theta. They're wanting us to find what is torque. Do we have any formulas for torque? Actually, I think we normally it's typically it's V on the in the yeah in the equation sheet it's theta, but we all as physics students understand know that that is the angle between the force and the um, the radial line the radius there. So V is actually this angle right up here. So in this case, we're going to have to do a quick calculation. V is equal to. 90 minus 25, so grab a calculator if you don't already have one. Yeah, 65 sounds good. All right, so um, the center of gravity is really helpful because you could say, well, what's the torque of, of this, these particles and, uh, at times this distance and, and the torque caused by these particles at this distance and the torque caused by these particles at this distance and, and the answer is who cares about all those other particles we can condense this all of those particles to just one point right here you don't have to figure out all of their little very infinitesimally small masses you just say all of the mass is exerted right here does that make sense yeah. so uh weight for the force happens to be the weight force so i'll put weight times the radius times the sine of V. Uh, Y'all remember the formula for weight? Weight mass equals times mass times gravity. So it's mg times r times the sine of V. And I write that whole thing out just this one time because normally if this is going to be 90 degrees, I'm going to end up writing very quickly mgr for the, for the weight force. Anyway, so here we go. So 3.2 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times a radius of 1.6 meters times the sine of 65 degrees. Since we're taking the sine of something in degrees, make sure your calculator, calculator is in degree mode. All right, approximate answer. Now the units are kilogram meter per second squared times meters. So a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton, so it's a newton meter, 45.5. Now that's not quite the whole entire answer, okay? What is the direction that this is causing it rotating? Downward. Okay, yeah, it's not the fact that it's downward, it's the fact <coughs> that it's counter, counter or it's uh, uh, clockwise, downward. which is negative. It's weird that clockwise is negative and counterclockwise is positive, but if you've done math, you understand why. Positive will put us in the first quadrant first. So, the gravitational torque is negative 45.5 newtons. Meters, three meters. Sure. How do you get phi? Oh, okay. Well, you know that phi must be the angle between the radius and the weight force, or the, the, the force that's being applied. Okay? Um, and so this is a right angle, right triangle. 
weight is going straight down, mm -hmm. and this angle theta is measured, is, is, this is the horizontal because it says it's 25 degrees above the horizontal. So this is horizontal, this is vertical, therefore it's 90 degrees. Uh, that's 25, so 90 oh, minus yeah. 25. Right. Good thing. Figure out that. Good question. Somebody else have another question. All right. Let's see. Uh, just want to have this one just for a brief discussion. Where do you think the center of gravity would be on this L-shaped piece? We'll assume it looks exactly like this. Maybe D? Maybe it's a D? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's one of those dots. It's one of these dots. Now, maybe not. It's probably been about there because look, you've got all this stuff over here and not very much stuff over here, right? What about C? It's not. Um, in fact, the answer is A. Center of gravity does not need to actually be on the object, okay? But it is the point where everything to the left, all the mass at its distance to the left, would completely balance out with all the mass at those distances to the right, as well as the mass above and all the mass below. So, and you can kind of, if you can draw all, you know, all those lines of symmetry, um, that's sort of an, a weird thing. I just wanted to kind of show you it doesn't have to be on the actual object. Okay. Um, I want to show you one of the ways in which, or the, the, the first way actually, in which they calculate where is that center of gravity, okay? And uh, the best way to do that, if, it's, if, you, if you just have one object, like just a, like a ball, it's, it's really simple. It's just, you can, it's going to be at that center, the center of the ball, okay? Because that is a point which is equidistant from all the other points, they all balance each other out. Um, the next step is to say, okay, what if you have two balls, two objects, okay? And they're at different distances away from uh, your pivot point, okay? Or from the center of gravity. So where is the center of gravity going to be on this bar? We're assuming that this bar has absolutely no weight, okay? So what we're gonna do is figure out where is um, that center of gravity? In this case, you can see that the center of gravity is directly above the pivot, which means that this particular object is in balance. It, it, balance, not, well, it's in balance, not in balance. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, what we want to do is we want to figure out um, a generic formula that'll tell us where the center of gravity is, okay? And the idea is, is that if you can figure it out for two objects, then if you add a third object on there, then you just say, okay, Figure out where the center of gravity is for those two objects. Now take that center of gravity and compare it with the third one and, and figure out where the new center of gravity is. And if you have four, then you deal with all three of them, which by deal with the first two, and then you can deal with the fourth one. And then you would add a fifth one. And so you can uh, follow this process on and on and on, and then you can use computers to figure all that stuff out at that point, okay? So what we're gonna do is we want everything here to be balanced. Here we go. They want us to find what is or what the coordinates of the center of gravity. Okay, uh, they've gone to the trouble of giving us a number line down here. Uh, zero is over here. Who cares? Somewhere off. X one is the location of the heavy object. The pivot point is at location x c g, and x two or sorry, mass two is at point x two. All right, we're using all variables, so we're not locked into zero or getting anything weird like that. Um, do you all notice that the pivot point is a little bit closer to the heavier object? Is that kind of what you would expect? Yeah, is the center of gravity? Absolutely. So let's figure out what is the torque on the bar due to this guy right here. So torque one is going to equal the force times the radius times the sine of that angle. And I should say force one, perhaps. Now in this case, what's, what is the force that this is at, that? Weight. Weight, okay. So I'm just gonna write mass one, gee, instead of writing something, 
So we have the size of force one equals weight one, which equals mass one times gravity. You okay with that, Kevin? All right, so I've got mass one times gravity times R. Now, what is phi in this case? Phi is equal to 90 degrees. And the sine of 90 degrees? One. one. So I'm just gonna write this as M1G times R rather than writing times one over here. So we all know that sine of 90 degrees is one. Okay? And now, what's this R1 distance right here? I should say R1. Force one equals mass one times G times, anybody know on a number line? XCG minus XM. That is correct. Just the difference between those two. So X, CG minus X1. That is the torque on the bar caused by mass one. And we could do this same analysis for mass two. Torque two equals force two, radius two, sine of phi two. But everything else is exact is the same. The force is the weight force, which is mass times gravity. So torque two is mass two times gravity times R2 times one, since in this case, phi is also one. So we have torque two is M2G and then X2 minus X2. Yep. X2 minus X2G. Now on your handout, I gave you a whole nice big space over there on the right. To so we can continue this problem over here. So now we're going to write uh, the summation of the torques. So uh, the summation of the torque is equal to the net torque. Now one of those is positive and one of those is negative. Which is which? The You mean tau one? That, right, yeah. Yeah, that's positive. And this one over here is causing it to rotate this way, which is negative. So we could say torque one plus a negative torque two. Mm -hmm. And all of that equals zero because they completely cancel each other out. So torque one was mass one times gravity times X CG minus X one minus mass two times gravity times X two minus X I'm just going to get this thing going. All right. Um, let's see, what can we do here? Do y'all see that I've got a, a G here and a G here? Mm -hmm. So if I divide this whole side by G, that'll cancel out. Mm -hmm. And divide this side by G, zero divided by G is zero. zero. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to distribute this mass one and I'm going to distribute this mass two. So I have mass one times X CG minus mass one X one minus max two X two and then minus a negative is a positive mass two X CG zero. What am I looking for again here, Nancy? What's all this? The, the balance of XC, the 
been between X and Z, like the way. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find out where this point is, where that center of gravity is, which is the location X, C, G. That's this guy right here, X, C, G, X, C, G. So I'm going to uh, put those two terms together. So I've got mass one, X, C, G, that's this guy, plus mass two, X, C, G, that's this guy, equals, and now I'm going to add these two terms to both sides so that it gets, gets rid of them. So I'm going to add M1, X1 to that side, so M1, X1, and I'm going to add M2, X2 there. Notice now I could factor out an X, C, G. So X, C, G is mass 1 plus mass 2 equals blah, 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 that same stuff over there. So I, I'll write it in here for my final answer. X, C, G, the center of gravity location is equal to the mass of the uh, M1, X1 plus M2, X2 divided by mass one plus mass two. All right, so what this says is that the location of the center of gravity between two objects is equal to the mass of the first object times its position plus the mass of the second object times its position divided by the sum of their masses. Or you could say divide by the sum, the, you know, the mass of the whole entire system. What's really interesting, and you can take my word for it or practice this on your own if you want to, if we were to add a third object, then the math works out such that it just would be, the numerator would become mass three x three and we'd extend this over plus mass three. If we were to add a fourth object, then it would be plus mass four x four, and the denominator would just add the mass of that fourth object. And so this uh, is a great formula. It's gonna tell us exactly where that center of gravity is located, okay? In the x position. And if you happen to have something which, uh, you know, have something I should put some things. Let's say you have some sort of weird object which has uh, a ball up there and then an a part right here and then a part right here. You can figure out, and they're all sort of connected like this with some weird wires or whatever. Bear with me here. If you figured out what is the x and y coordinate of this point, what is the x and y coordinate of this point, and the x and y coordinate of this point, you could figure out what is the x coordinate of the center of gravity of that entire system, and what is the y coordinate, in this case it's probably going to be a little bit lower, maybe something right about here, y center of gravity of that whole entire system, and you could figure out where would the where would the center of gravity, and therefore where would be the balance point of something that's rather complex, okay? Uh, the formula for the y center of gravity, it's exactly the same as the x. y center of gravity equals mass one, y one, plus mass two, y two, over mass one plus mass two, and so on and so forth, all right? Uh, when we have extremely complicated objects, uh, you think of things that really need to be balanced, like cars, planes, um, uh, even uh, shipping containers, that they need to be balanced properly. Uh, they can plug all of this information into a computer with these formulas and figure out where exactly is the center of mass, where is the center of gravity going to be located, okay? so. Turn the page, I think you have this problem on the back there. Yes? Mm -hmm. Let's 
go ahead and plug this in real quick. It says a one meter long dumbbell has a 10 kilogram mass on the left and a five kilogram mass on the right. Find the position of the center of gravity, <coughs> the point where the dumbbell should be lifted in order to remain balanced. Now, they have the center of gravity in their picture drawn a little bit closer to the 10 kilogram than the five. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's kind of what you were showing over there earlier, several of you were talking about with the pencil and eraser and stuff like that. It's gonna be closer to the heavier side. Let's figure it out, plug it in real quick. X center of gravity equals mass one. Call them out to me here, folks. 10 times, oh, they put it that as a zero, oh nice. Okay, zero plus they have that at the one meter mark, which is great. Over. And gravity is. Which is. So 0.33. So they're saying this is at about the 0.33 location. Does that match our expectations? Yeah. yeah. In fact, if you kind of logically think it through, it's twice as close to here as it is to here, which is what you'd expect since this happens to be 10 kilograms, five kilograms, twice as heavy on that side. So the center of gravity is gonna be twice as close. Okay, great. Turn the page. Charlie, how do I get this thing spinning? Pushing? Yeah, give it a push. Okay, I give it a push at a distance, which is called a. Somebody else help, help me out. What's a push at a distance? Force. Okay, force at a distance. Uh, torque. Torque. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's what I get to rotate. Get it, get to start rotating. Okay, right now it doesn't. It's not spinning at all. Okay, but now it's spinning, right? So. Um, what has changed about this object, about this two by four? Not spinning, now spinning. What's that? Uh, let's, let's go back to last week when we had those little fidget spinners. Okay, acceleration, uh, it, it, has, it has experienced angular acceleration. What I'm looking for is that its angular velocity has changed. Okay, it's not spinning, now it's spinning. So we would say it went from an omega, an angular velocity of zero, to now some other value, all right? So it's spinning. So what we said is whenever its <coughs> angular acceleration is, changes, or sorry, whenever its angular velocity changes, then that means it has, it's kind of hard to do this. I don't have my fidget spinner. Here we go, we use this one. All right, so if you apply a force, then it's going to change its angular acceleration. Okay, more specifically, if you apply a torque. Does that make sense? So it's spinning around, and you give it a force, it'll spin even faster. Who's got that? Does anybody have a fidget spinner? And all the fidget spinners are gone. All right, y'all are looking at me like I don't have no idea what I'm talking about here. So here you go, here's the big idea. Sorry, I don't have a fidget spinner, but all right. A torque causes an angular acceleration. Now, think back to our kinematics discussion, okay? A force, a push or a pull, caused what? Regular acceleration, okay? So this is just the rotational aspect of that same thing, all right? So here we go. Uh, when you give a push or a pull on, on uh, maybe a particle here on the end of a bar and you give it a, a push, therefore it's going to have acceleration. That acceleration is going to be tangent to the circle and we would call that its tangent, tangential acceleration. That is equal to the force divided by the mass of this particle. Um, 
what we're going to be thinking about right now is just one particle rotating around a circle that I'm pushing. Okay, so it's sort of like it's tied with down with this bar. Okay. Now, uh, last week we went over the connecting formula that tangential acceleration is equal to alpha times the radius. That's the change in the uh, ang that's the angular acceleration times the radius. All right. So uh, those two uh, equations we can connect. So force divided by mass. So you have AT tangential acceleration, tangential acceleration. So therefore force over mass equals alpha times r. All right, and so now I'm gonna multiply uh, both sides by the mass. Hold on. Oh, let's just switch this around first. Alpha r equals force over mass. And I will divide both sides by the radius. So alpha equals force divided by mass times the radius. And then for no apparent reason, I'm going to multiply by the radius. So that I have alpha equals the force times the radius divided by the mass times the radius squared. Now look at that numerator. What does that numerator look like? Torque. Looks like torque, since in this particular case, I pushed it at a 90 degree angle uh, to the radius. So that leads us to the equation alpha equals torque over the mass times the radius squared. Let me expand that over here. Alpha equals torque over mass times the radius squared. This is the angular acceleration of a particle moving in a circle. And that is the result of a torque on the particle. And that angular acceleration is affected by the mass of the particle and r, which is the radius or the distance between the pivot point and the edge of the circle. So quick demonstration, here I have <clears throat> a ball on the end of a string, and I've got a pivot point. If I give this ball a force, and I'm going to put it this way, then it's going to start going in angular, it's going to have a, a change in its angular velocity, okay, so it's going to have angular acceleration, and we could calculate what that angular acceleration is based on the mass of the ball, the radius, okay, and the torque. Now the torque is the result of the force that I'm exerting on it uh, and the radius as well. Does that make sense? So if I were to, if I were to shorten it up a little bit, um, we can kind of find what that angle acceleration is. Is that kind of, there we go. So you can see it goes from zero to spinning, all right? And so that is what causes the change in angular velocity, which causes this, all right? Now, that may look very similar to linear acceleration equals force over mass, and it is. 
This is the beginning of Newton's second law for rotation. We had Newton's second law, acceleration equals force over mass. Now we have angular acceleration equals torque over this weird thing, mr squared. On Friday, we're going to expand this out and see exactly what that is. It has a special name, and it's called moment of inertia. And it affects how easily something starts to rotate it or not. Uh, while you're packing your stuff up, I'll tell you, we have two quizzes, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, okay? Uh, they're team quizzes, I'll let you choose your own team, you can't have the same team both days, okay? Uh, it's going to be a little bit on the honor system since I'm not going to be here for those, okay? So give it your best shot. If you don't finish in time, don't worry, we're going to have uh, a couple of days next week for you to finish and do any corrections that you need to, all right? But I'm gonna be gone, and so there's nothing better for, for y'all to do while I'm gone than take a quiz together. Open book, open note, but it has to be your physical book. For both? For both, for Wednesday and Thursday quiz. So you cannot uh, use your Mac book for all the audience reasons. All right, questions about the quiz and other things, Emily. Uh, not, not until later. Okay. I mean, I'm not gonna be here. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, for us that won't be here on Thursday, um, for us that won't be here on Thursday, we'll just make it up when we come back. We'll, yep. We'll make it up. Okay. Okay. Oh, both Let's kill this thing. Yeah. So when